Sweet Potato Pie by Eugenia Collier. From up here on the 14th floor, my brother Charlie looks like an insect scurrying among other insects. A deep feeling of love surges through me. Despite the distance, he seems to feel it, for he turns and scans the upper windows, but failing to find me, continues on his way. I watch him move quickly, gingerly it seems to me, down Fifth Avenue and around the corner to a shabby taxi cab. In a moment, he will be heading back uptown. I turn from the window and flop down on the bed, shoes and all, perhaps because of what happened this afternoon or maybe just because I see Charlie so seldom, my thoughts hover over him like hummingbirds. The cheerful, impersonal tidiness of this room is a world away from Charlie's walk-up flat in Harlem and a hundred worlds from the bare, noisy shanty where he and the rest of us spent what there was of childhood. I close my eyes and side by side I see the Charlie of my boyhood and the Charlie of this afternoon as clearly as if I were looking at a split TV screen. Another surge of love, seasoned with gratitude, wells up in me. As far as I know, Charlie never had any childhood at all. The oldest children of sharecroppers never do. Mama and Pa were shadowy figures whose voices I heard vaguely in the morning when sleep was shallow, and whom I glimpsed as they left for the field before I was fully awake, or as they trudged wearily into the house at night, when my lids were irresistibly heavy. They came into sharp focus only on special occasions. One such occasion was the day when the crops were in and the sharecroppers were paid. In our cabin, there was so much excitement in the air that even I, the baby, responded to it. For weeks, we had been running out of things that we could neither grow nor get on credit. On the evening of that day, we waited anxiously for our parents' return. Then we would cluster around the rough wooden table, I on Lil's lap or clinging to Charlie's neck, little Alberta nervously tugging her plate. Janie crouched at Mama's elbow like a panther about to spring, and all seven of us silent for once, waiting. Pa would place the money on the table, gently, for it was made from the sweat of their bodies and from their children's tears. Mama would count it out in little piles, her dark face stern and, I think now, beautiful. Not with the hollow beauty of well-modeled features, but with the strong radiance of one who has suffered and never yielded. This was this for store bill, she would mutter, making a little pile. This for collection. This for piece of gingham. And so on stretching the money as tight over our collective needs as Jamie's outgrown pants were stretched over my bottom. Well, that's the crop. She would look up at Pa at last. It'll do. Pa's face would relax and a general grin flitted from child to child. We would survive, at least for the present. The other time when my parents were solid entities was at church. On Sundays, we would don our threadbare Sunday go-to-meeting clothes and tramp along with neighbors similarly attired to the Tabernacle Baptist Church, the frail edifice of bare boards held together by who knows what, which was all that my parents ever knew of security and future promise. Being the youngest and therefore the most likely to err, I was plopped between my father and my mother on the long wooden bench. They sat huge and eternal like twin mountains at my sides. I remember my father's still black profile silhouetted against the sunny window, looking back into dark recesses of time, into some dim antiquity, like an ancient ceremonial mask. My mother's face, usually sternly set, changed with the varying nuances of her emotion its planes shifting, shaped by the soft highlights of the sanctuary, as she progressed from a subdued amen to a loud help me Jesus wrung from the depths of her gaunt frame. My early memories of my parents are associated with special occasions. The contours of my everyday were shaped by Lil and Charlie, the oldest children, who rode herd on the rest of us while Pa and Mama toiled in fields not their own. 
Not until years later did I realize that Lil and Charlie were little more than children themselves. Lil had the loudest, screechiest voice in the county. When she yelled, boy, you better get yourself in here, you got yourself in there. It was Lil who caught and bathed us, Lil who fed us and sent us to school, Lil who punished us when we needed punishing and comfort us when we needed comforting. If her voice was loud, so was her laughter. When she laughed, everybody laughed. And when Lil sang, everybody listened. Charlie was taller than anybody in the world, including, I was certain, God. From his shoulders, where I spent considerable time in the earliest years, the world had a different perspective. I looked down at tops of heads rather than the undersides of chins. As I grew older, Charlie became more father than brother. Those days return in fragments of splintered memory. Charlie's slender, dark hands whittling a toy from a chunk of wood, his face thin and intense, brown as the loaves low baked when there was flour. Charlie's quick fingers guiding a stick of charred kindling over a bit of scrap paper, making a wondrous picture take shape. Jamie's face or Alberta's rag doll or the spare figure of our bony brown dog. Charlie's voice low and terrible in the dark, telling ghost stories so delightfully dreadful that later in the night, the moan of the wind through the chinks in the wall sent a scurrying to the security of Charlie's palate, Charlie's sleeping form. Some memories are more than fragmentary. I can still feel the whap of the wet dish rag across my mouth. Somehow I developed a stutter which Charlie was determined to cure. Someone had told him that an effective cure was to slap the stutterer across the mouth with a sopping wet dish rag. Therefore, whenever I began, let's get get a whap from nowhere would come this ubiquitous rag. Charlie would always insist, I don't want to hurt you none, buddy, and whap again. I don't know when or why I stopped stuttering, but I stopped. Already laid waste by poverty, we were easy prey for ignorance and superstition, which hunted us like hawks. We sought education fervently, and for most of us, futilely, for the sum total of our combined energies was required for mere brute survival. Inevitably, each child had to leave school and bear his share of the eternal burden. Eventually, the family's hopes for learning fastened on me, the youngest. I remember, uh, I think I remember, for I could not have been more than five. One frigid day, Pa huddled on a rickety stool before the coal stove, took me on his knee, and studied me gravely. I was a skinny little thing, they tell me, with large, solemn eyes. Well, boy, Pa said at last, If you got to depend on your looks for what you get out in this world, you just as well lay down right now. His hand was rough from the plow, but gentle as it touched my cheek. Lucky for you, you got a mind, and that's something ain't everybody got. You go to school, boy. Get yourself some learning. Make something out in yourself. Ain't nothing you can't do if you got learning. Charlie was determined that I would break the chain of poverty, that I would be somebody. As we worked our small vegetable garden in the sun or pulled a bucket of brackish water from the well, Charlie would tell me, you ain't gonna be no poor farmer, buddy. You gonna be a teacher, maybe a doctor or a lawyer. One thing, bad as you is, you ain't gonna be no preacher. I love school with a desperate passion, which became more intense when I began to realize that a monumental struggle it was for my parents and brothers and sisters to keep me there. The cramped, dingy classroom became a battleground where I was victorious. I stayed on top of my class. With glee, I outread, outfigured, outspelled the country boys who mocked my poverty, calling me the boy with eyes in the back of his head, the eyes being the perpetual holes in my hand-me-down pants. As the years passed, economic strain was eased enough to make it possible for me to go on to high school. There were fewer mouths to feed, for one thing. Alberta went north to find work at 16, and Jamie died at 12. 
I finished high school at the head of my class. For Mama and Pa and each of my brothers and sisters, my success was a personal triumph. One by one, they came to me the crumpled bef- the week before commencement, bringing crumpled dollar bills and coins long ho- hoarded, muttering, Here, buddy, put this on your graduation clothes. My graduation suit was the first suit that was all my own. On graduation night, our cabin, less crowded now, was a frantic collage of frayed nerves. I thought Charlie would drive me mad. Buddy, you ain't pressed out them pants right. Can't you get a better shine in them shoes? Lord, you done messed up that tie. Overwhelmed by the combination of Charlie's nerves and my own, I finally exploded. Man, cut it out! Abruptly, he stopped tugging at my tie, and I was afraid I'd hurt his feelings. It's okay, Charlie. Look, you're strangling me. The tie's okay. Charlie relaxed a little and gave a rather sheepish chuckle. Sure, buddy. He gave my shoulder a rough joggle. But you gotta look good. You somebody. My valedictory address was the usual idealistic sentimental nonsense. I have forgotten what I said that night, but the sight of Ma and Pa and the rest is like a lithograph burned on my memory. Lil, her round face made beautiful by her proud smile. Pa, his head held high, eyes loving and fierce. Mama, radiant. Years later, when her shriveled hands were finally still, my mind kept coming back to her as she was now. I believe this moment was the apex of her entire life. All of them, even Alberta down from Baltimore, different now, but united with them in her pride. And Charlie, on the end of the road, still somehow the protector of them all. Charlie looked as if he were in the presence of something sacred. As I made my way through the carefully rehearsed speech, it was as if part of me were standing outside watching the whole thing. Their proud, work-worry faces, myself wearing the suit that was their combined strength and love and hope, Lil with her lovely, low-pitched voice, Charlie with the hands of an artist, Pa and Mama with who knows what potential lost with their sweat in the fields. I realized in that moment that I wasn't necessarily the smartest, only the youngest. And the luckiest, the war came along, and I exchanged three years of my life, including a fair amount of my blood and a great deal of pain, for the GI Bill and a college education, Strange how time can slip by like water flowing through your fingers. One by one, the changes came. The old house empty at last, the rest of us scattered. For me, marriage, graduate school, kids, a professorship, and by now a thickening waistline and thinning hair. My mind spins off the years, and I am back to this afternoon and today's Charlie. Still long and lean, still gentle-eyed, still my greatest fan and still determined to keep me on the ball. I didn't tell Charlie I would be at a professional meeting in New York and would surely visit. He and B would have spent days in fixing up, and I would have had to be company. No, I would drop in on them, take them by surprise before they had a chance to stiffen up. I was eager to see them. It had been so long. Yesterday and this morning were taken up with meetings in the posh Fifth Avenue Hotel, a place we could not have dreamed in our boyhood. Late this afternoon, I shook loose and headed for Harlem, hoping that Charlie still came home for a few hours before his evening run. Leaving the glare and glitter of downtown, I entered the subway that lurks like the dark, incredible id beneath the surface of the city. When I emerged, I was in Harlem. Whenever I come to Harlem, I feel somehow as if I were coming home, to some mythic ancestral home. The problems are real, the people are real, yet there is some mysterious epic quality about Harlem, as if all black people began and ended there, as if each had left something of himself. As if in Harlem the very heart of blackness pulsed its beautiful tortured rhythms. Joining the throngs of people that saunter Lenox Avenue late afternoons, I headed for Charlie's apartment. Along the way, I savored the panorama of Harlem. Women with shopping bags trudging wearily home, little kids flitting saucily through the crowd, groups of adolescent boys striding boldly along, 
some boisterous, some ominously silent. Tables of merchandise spread on the sidewalks with hawkers singing their siren songs of irresistible bargains. A blaring microphone sending forth waves of words to draw passers-by into a restless bunch around a slender young man whose eyes had seen truth. Defeated men standing around on street corners or sitting on steps, heads down, hands idle, posters announcing Garvey Day. Buy black stamped on pavements, store windows bright with things African. Stores still boarded up, a livid scar from last year's rioting. There was a terrible tension in the air. I thought of how quickly dry timber becomes a roaring fire from a single spark. I mounted the steps of Charlie's building, old and in need of paint like all the rest, and pushed the button to his apartment. The graffiti on the dirty wall recorded the fantasies of past visitors. Some of it was even a dialogue of sorts. Well, it's Buddy, roared Charlie as I arrived on the third floor. B, B. Come here, girl. It's Buddy. And somehow I was simultaneously shaking Charlie's hand, getting clapped on the back, and being buried in the fervor of B's gigantic hug. They swept me from the hall into their dim apartment. Buddy, what are you doing here? Why didn't you tell me you was coming to New York? His face was so lit up with pleasure that in spite of the inroads of time, he still looked like the Charlie of years gone by, excited over a new litter of kittens. The place look a mess. Why don't you let us know, put in B, suddenly distressed. Looks fine to me, girl, and so do you. And she did. B is a fine-looking woman, plump and firm still, with rich brown skin and thick black hair. Mary, Lucy, look, Uncle Buddy's here. Two neat little girls came shyly from the TV. Uncle Buddy was something of a celebrity in this house. I hugged them heartily, much to their discomfort. Charlie, where are you getting all these pretty women? We all sat in the warm kitchen where B was preparing dinner. It felt good there. Beautiful odors mingled in the air. Charlie sprawled in a chair near mine, his long arms and legs akimbo. No longer shy, the tinier girl sat on my lap, while her sister darted here and there like a merry little water bug. B bustled about, managing to keep up with both the conversation and the cooking. I told them about the conference I was attending, and knowing it would give them pleasure, I mentioned that I had addressed the group that morning. Charlie's eyes glistened. You hear that, B? He whispered. Buddy done spoke in front of all them professors. Sure, I hear, B answered briskly, stirring something that was making an aromic steam. I bet he weren't even scared. I bet them professors learned something, too. We all chuckled. Well, anyway, I said, I hope they did. We talked about a hundred different things after that. Bee's job in the school cafeteria, my Jess and the kids, our scattered family. Seem like we don't get together no more, not since Mama and Pa passed on, said Charlie sadly. I ain't even got a Christmas card from Alberta f- for three, four year now. Well, ain't no two y'all in the same city. And everybody's scratching to make ends meet, Bee replied. Ain't nobody got time to get together. Yeah, that's the way it goes, I guess, I said. But it sure is good to see you, buddy. Say, look, Lil told me about the cash you sent the children last winter when Jake was out of work all that time. She sure appreciated it. Lord, man, as close as you and Lil stuck to me when I was a kid, I owed her that and more. Say, B, did I ever tell you about the time? And we swung into the usual reminiscence. They insisted that I stay for dinner. Persuading me was no hard job. Fish fried golden, ham hocks and collard greens, cornbread. If I'd tried to leave, my feet wouldn't have taken me. It was good to sit there in Charlie's kitchen, my coat and tie flung over a chair, surrounded by soul food and love. Say, buddy, a couple months back I picked up a kid from your school. No stuff? I asked him, did he know you? He say he was in your class last year. Did you get his name? No, I didn't ask him that. Man, he told me you were the best teacher he had. He said you were one smart cat. He told you that because you're my brother. Your brother? I didn't tell him I was your brother. I said you was an old friend of mine. I put my fork down and leaned over. What you tell him that for? Charlie explained patiently as he had explained things when I was a child and had missed an obvious truth. 
I didn't want your students to know your brother wasn't nothing but a cab driver. You somebody. You're a nut, I said gently. You should have told that kid the truth. I wanted to say I'm proud of you. You've got more on the ball than most people. I know. I wouldn't have been anything at all except for you. But then he would have been embarrassed. B brought in the dessert, homemade sweet potato pie. Buddy, I must have knew you were coming. I just had a mind I wanted to make sweet potato pie. There's nothing in this world I like better than B's sweet potato pie. Lord, girl, how you expect me to eat all that? The slice she put before me was outrageously big. The moist and, and covered with a light golden crust. I ate it all. B, I'm going to have to eat and run, I said at last. Charlie guffawed. Much as you ate, I don't see how you're going to walk, let alone run. He went out to get his cab from the garage several blocks away. B was washing the tiny girl's face. Wait a minute, buddy. I'm going to give you the rest of that pie to take with you. Great. I'd eaten all I could hold, but my spirit was still hungry for sweet potato pie. B got out some wax paper and wrapped up the rest of the pie. That'll do you for a snack tonight. She slipped it into a brown paper bag. I gave her a long goodbye hug. B, I love you for a lot of things. Your cooking is one of them. We had a last comfortable laugh together. I kissed the little girls and went outside to wait for Charlie, holding the bag of pie reverently. In a minute, Charlie's ancient cab limped to the curb. I plopped into the seat next to him and we headed downtown. Soon we were assailed by the garish lights of New York on a sultry spring night. We chatted as Charlie skillfully managed the heavy traffic. I looked at his long hands on the wheel and wondered what they could have done with Artist Brush. We stopped a bit down the street from my hotel. I invited him in, but he said he had to get on with his evening run. But as I opened the door to get out, he commanded in the old familiar voice, Buddy, you wait. For a moment I thought my coat was torn or something. What's wrong? What's that you got there? I was bewildered. That? You mean this bag? That's a piece of sweet potato pie B fixed for me. You ain't going through the lobby of no big hotel carrying no brown paper bag. Man, you crazy. Of course I'm going. Look, B fixed it for me. That's my pie. Charlie's eyes were miserable. Folks in that hotel don't go through the lobby carrying no brown paper bags. That's country. And you can't neither. You somebody, buddy. You gotta be right. Now give me that bag. I want the pie, Charlie. I ain't got nothing to prove to anybody. I couldn't believe it. But there was no point in arguing. Foolish as it seemed to me, it was important to him. You gotta look right, buddy. You can't nobody look dignified carrying a brown paper bag. So finally thinking how tasty it would have been and how seldom I got a chance to eat anything that good, I handed over my bag of sweet potato pie. If it was that important to him, I tried not to show my irritation. Okay, man, take good ear now. I slammed the door harder than I had intended, walked rapidly to the hotel, and entered the brilliant crowded lobby. That Charlie, I thought. Walking slower now, I crossed the carpeted lobby toward the elevator, still thinking of my lost sack snack. I had to admit that of all the herd of people who jostled each other in the lobby, not one was carrying a brown paper bag or anything but expensive attache cases or slick packages from exclusive shops. I suppose we all operate according to the symbols that are meaningful to us, and to Charlie a brown paper bag symbolizes the humble life he thought I had left. I was somebody. I don't know what made me glance back, but I did. And suddenly the tears of laughter, toil, and love of lifetime burst around me like fireworks in the night sky. For there, following a few steps behind, came Charlie, proudly carrying a brown paper bag full of sweet potato pie.